Craig, we've read a lot on, on uh, I don't know, we've heard and seen these pictures of lions lying in the road and uh, that during COVID, the animals are taking over. Um, I mean, is that, is that happening there? I mean, what, what's life like in the Kruger National Park without, I'm assuming there are no tourists, there are not many people running around. That's right. The landscape is so quiet. It's nice, you know. So, um, it, although it gives us the upper hand in the sort of in the wildlife security arena, I think the animals have also they've got short memories. You know, they've they've colonized the world. They <laughs> spatially, um, I don't think they're using the landscape differently, but temporarily for sure. So they're coming out at different times of the day. So, you know, they're not avoiding um, the the anthropogenic influences like they used to. And I think it's the same animals. We're just seeing them at different times of the day now all over the show. Great. And uh, has it affected the anti-poaching work that you're doing? Uh, we've also been reading in, in, in these newspaper articles that there's been a huge increase in poaching because people are obviously struggling with not being able to work. Um, has it affected you running an anti-poaching unit, aren't you? So have you seen a yeah, huge yeah. influx from um, desperate communities around these parks looking uh, looking for food? Man, that, that question comes up all the time and there's a lot of um, hoo-ha about it on social media and all over the show because I think people put two and two together and come up with five, but the reality is different. You know, we're seeing um, a total different story to what it was just before lockdown. So, you know, if I, if I had to be honest, I would say that there has been no effort from the poacher's side um you know from and, and we've got two kinds of poaching obviously you've got the bushmeat poachers and uh, a little bit of traditional medicine poachers and then of course you've got these high-end commercial syndicated poachers that are after the rhinos and whatever and both are dead quiet dead quiet but you know so so i look at it and i say well you know maybe it's because the the people that worked in the parks were aiding and abetting the poachers because no poacher can be successful on the landscape unless he has somebody on the inside assisting him you know and they've all been sent home because of lockdown they're not essential services so there they sit at home so they've become a bit redundant to uh, the poaching arena uh, that's the one thing and then the other thing is of course that the supply and demand chain must have been interrupted because i suppose most of the horns and and what have you leave our shores either um, in suitcases and baggage but one way or the other there's there's no movement between our borders so it's, it's a typical supply and demand. So nobody's going to go and poach a rhino horn and run around in the community and saying, hey, do you want to buy a rhino horn? You know, it's a supply and demand. It's like, get me a horn, it's 50,000 bucks. When you're finished, I'll give you the rest of the money. So that, that's been interrupted. But, I, you know, we're a bit nervous because we know TERS and the UIF payments and all these kind of things are going to come to an end. And a lot of the staff that were sent home from the lodges are sitting there now and they're on their last salary now. So we must watch the space. And, you know, we don't, we don't know if there's going to be a massive flood of demand after, you know, lockdown or whatever it might be. And of course, you know, all the, the morals and the, the ethics that we've tried to build in the local communities, I'll go into a bit of that in my presentation, you know, that investment that we've made in the communities to build patriotism towards the landscape and la la la, that can only work if you've got food on the table. You know, how are you supposed to convince somebody to buy into a philosophy when they've got hungry, starving children? So, Craig, COVID, I mean, we'll ask you more questions at the end. It has actually been good in your eyes for nature, for, for the park at the moment. Let's say it's a double-edged sword. So, uh, yes, uh, from that point of view, but no, because the revenue stream has been interrupted. So it's not sustainable to, to keep us in lockdown. Uh, just so that the animals can frolic, if you like, you know, <laughs> because the, the cracks will start to show pretty soon. I think we have, to, we have to be aware that the local market is probably going to be the first to bounce back. And the local market is bushmeat and traditional medicine um, gadgetry or whatever, you know. And there's going to be human wildlife conflict issues as well. There's um, huge social impacts on our borders that are going to take years to rectify after this, you know, where somebody had a, it's called a human dignity, you know, you, you're, you're a dignified game ranger working at a lodge, you wear a smart uniform, you drive a, a land cruiser, blah, 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 the next thing you know, you are sitting at home with no way to provide for your family and so on. So you've gone from hero to zero, both in the community and, and in your own household. 
So we've lost a lot of that human dignity. And to try and fix that, to try and bridge that gap, uh, you know, after this lockdown, that's going to take many years. So, um, so yes, good on the one hand to buy us a reprieve, but you know, what are the knock-on effects of this kind of thing? Shall we try see if you can share your screen? And maybe you can tell us a bit more about the Black Mambas. It's not a snake only. It's the name of your <laughs> unit. And why you set it up and um, where you are. Let's see if you can do that. Okay. It's coming. And share it. Okay. Are we ready to rock and roll? We are ready to rock and roll. <laughs> Very nice. Okay. That's our official logo. A little badgy. It's on my uniform there and on all the members' uniforms, and we've got various different versions of it. It's a proudly South African brand, hence the flag in the background, black rhino being the most endangered of the rhino species in sub-Sahara. And then uh, we've got the two most dangerous snakes, the black mambas, the one looking to the east, the other one looking to the west. That's poacher time, and they, they've got the rhinos back. So that, that was actually designed by the ladies that we recruited. I must give our sponsors a little bit of accolade, if I can figure this thing out. Hang on a second. I think I have to all right, there we go. So uh, the Department of Environmental Affairs through the Extended Public Works Program uh, is a co-funder of this thing, which I think lends some legitimacy to it. And, you know, it's a good news story for South Africa because most of the anti-poaching initiatives in and around the Greater Kruger National Park have got some kind of environmental monitor components. So through the Extended Public Works Program, there's funding flowing directly from national government into anti-poaching. People are not aware of that, and I just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, so where are we? There's the, the Greater Kruger landscape. The light green is the privately owned Salvi Sands, Timbavati, Bululi, Umbabat, etc. cetera. And, uh, and we are sitting right there in the western extremity on the little pimple, the western pimple. We have a massive chunk of the, the western boundary fence. And interestingly enough, there sits the Kruger Park on the South African map. It's 3% of South Africa's landscape. So when you hear that, oh, there's too many elephants and la, 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 la. Really, there's too many elephants in 3%. And I don't, I, I would never, that's another talk, by the way. I never subscribe to this too many. That's, that's where all our eggs are sitting. That's our basket, you know, for the big five on, an, on a, on a free-ranging open landscape. And it's open to Zimbabwe and Mozambique and Botswana right up in the north. The western boundary is loosely fenced around here, all the way up there. On this western boundary that way, if you had a good pair of hiking shoes, you could walk all the way to the beach in Mozambique. And you could go all the way to Victoria Falls and the Okavango Swamps if you had a big enough water bottle to make it through the Kalahari Desert. So, yeah, this is the last fence on the western boundary. It's three million hectares in total if you include the Mozambican side over there. It's quite substantial if you come from Luxembourg. I think that's quite daunting. So what else did I want to say about this? Oh, yeah, you can just imagine the, 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 the conflict because, you know, this is the watershed here. The Drakensberg Mountains are sitting up here. So, you know, the water obviously flows from the high point to the low point. So you've got this nutrient pathway east-west, and the animals follow these nutrient pathways. If I, That's what I call it. I don't know if it has another technical name. So now here you sit with this problem that the Kruger Park is 60 kilometers wide at its widest point, and if you're an elephant, you'll cover that easily in, in 12 hours or less sort of thing. So it's quite significant that these um, private properties have come in. And of course, the Mozambican side, which gives extra range and reduces human wildlife conflict. But all the conflict sits here on the western boundary. This is where people want to come in and where animals want to go out. This is all tribal land here, with a lot of agriculturalized land, etc. So you can just imagine the, the stress on a manager trying to keep the animals in and the people out. You know, this poaching thing is not a new problem. You guys are living down in the Western Cape. So you guys know all about poaching, whether it's in the marine environment or, or wherever. So how do we attack this? Do we keep taking those rusty old tools out of our rusty old toolboxes and throwing the same solution at the same old problem? Because it hasn't worked in the past. We've never managed to get on top of this thing. And every time it comes back, it comes back twice as hard. If you think back to the late 80s, 90s, when the rhino poaching was really at its peak in those days, and the, the elephant poaching in the Kruger Park as well, in the mid 80s, there were maybe five access gates, very few tourists coming in, no cell phone coverage, 
a double fence patrolled by the military on the eastern boundary and the western boundary, north and south, etc. Now we have open boundaries, tourism going in all over the show, cell phone network coverage, diplomatic ties with our neighboring countries, la 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 la. So, you know, when the poachers come back, the landscape is different and the parameters are different. I think it's a much easier landscape for poachers to poach. So our mission is to make the landscape the most difficult and unprofitable or risky area to poach. It sounds all grandiose. Let's hope we'll get there eventually. That's the traditional approach. Bullet point number one is what I think every anti-poaching unit or every anti-poaching effort has ever tried to achieve. And then the second one is to develop a proud, sympathetic, sympathetic and patriotic community on our borders. Because that fence that I indicated earlier on the western boundary is not keeping people out of the park. Anybody that wants to come into the park and pay their fees and for South Africans, it's very cheap. And you can drive around and buzz around and have a lovely, lovely time. And there's so many NGOs and things that will even throw you onto the back of a vehicle and take you in for free. But what it is doing is it's separating values. You've got two distinct value systems. Now, if you go to France and you look at those things in the Louvre, you know, the French people are maybe proud to be the custodians of European arts and culture. Uh, and then they've got that hideous Eiffel, Eiffel Tower sticking out of the ground, that big piece of scrap metal. If you melted it down, you could give every hungry person in France 100 euros, but you can only do that once. You can sell a Rembrandt, uh, you know, and, and feed people, the boat people or whatever, but you can only do that once or twice, and then it's all gone. And yet the French people are happy to pay rates and taxes to have those art treasures secured and looked after. And people come from around the world to come and see them. So do you understand what, what I mean by trying to develop patriotism towards the landscape and the wildlife? It's, um, it's quite tricky to do that when you have somebody come from overseas and you say to, I mean, I say to these, these women of mine, please off you go then, patrol and protect this landscape against poachers. So anybody that comes into this reserve at night time, you must shoot them. Uh, but tomorrow, be ready because we're taking somebody from the United States or whatever out to go and shoot one. And the only difference is he's got a piece of paper and, and we don't. So, you know, those are the kind of hurdles that, um, that we have to cross. Why women? I mean, uh, it, it wasn't done before. And did you just wake up one day and say, let's, let's get the woman from the local community to do this? Why, why, why start something that hadn't been done before? Mike, you know how hard it is to find women out here in the bush? No, I'm joking. It's not. <laughs> That's got nothing to do with it. They do look better in the uniform, yes. But um, it's a long-term investment. If you look at that last bullet point over there, there's sisters, mothers, aunties, wives, and the future grandmothers. So if I take it from an um, anthropological point of view, I want to make an investment into the primary caregivers in that community. And that is going to ripple through multiple generations. Eventually, these ladies came to me uh, just out of high school. And eventually, a lot of them are mothers now. And eventually, they will retire. And they will be looking after the children of their children. So I get this multiple generational input, if that makes any sense. You know, women in the communities are the primary caregivers. That's why I want to target them. They have a totally different ethos and a different set of values around nurturing resources, whether it's water or firewood or the money that they earn, or their household, you know, and they have different responsibilities in the community. If I take those ladies out of the community and I stick them in the bush for the rest of their working career, it's counterproductive. So we have to have, we have, to have them going back to the communities regularly to spend time with their kids and, and la la la. Otherwise, I'm shooting myself in the foot with my philosophy. This is, this is an example of the training course. It's exactly the same training that any other field ranger does. Uh, to get into the anti-poaching arena, there's no quarter given just because they're women. But what I do insist upon is that they celebrate the fact that they are women. Uh, you know, I don't want to see G.I. Jane with a shaven head and, and black paint on your face. And then nobody knows if you're a man or a woman. They are women and they must be proud of that. That's one of our approaches. When we do a parade, I want lipstick, earrings, tra -la -la, Because they must be proud to be women. The last bullet point there social decay and a false economy. Just think of your abalone industry now, the, the, the social and the moral decay that has happened in those communities because it's gone too far down the road now. 
if you look at the top picture, top right hand side, they do go through weapons training. They are qualified to carry weapons, but we don't issue weapons to them because I want them to go home and tuck their kids into bed at night with cool stories about the elephants frolicking in water holes and the hyenas chirping and la la la, you know, all that Shangri La kind of stuff. What a beautiful sunset. Rather than sending somebody home and the kids think it's cool because mommy shot Uncle Pulemon or, you know, or, um, you know, they were involved in an operation and people died and guns had to be used and so on. Because that's what the kids think are cool out there at the moment. And we don't have the safety nets that the rest of the world has got when it comes to counseling and, um, you know, all those things that you go through. If you're from overseas and you pull your weapon on somebody, then the next thing you know, you're being investigated and I don't know what else. You use your gun here today and somebody dies, tomorrow you're back on duty. Or you're arrested for attempted murder, murder, whatever, standard operational procedure. Uh, Anuta, you remember those days with the Avalon thing, how much trouble some of us used to get into. I don't want them to go through that psychologically because that psychological bag baggage that will then undermine my original philosophy of imparting this wonderful nature kind of ethos onto their kids and their peers and so on. But at the same time, they have this critical role to play in monitoring surveillance and compliance. It's an MSC. I always say to them, you guys have all got your master's degree, you've all got an MSC. Monitoring surveillance and compliance. First line of defense, tell me where the poachers are coming in. We have armed response teams that will back them up. You know, if I put it on a bar graph, most of the anti-poaching units will have this big investment into uh, the militant side, guns and the bombs and the helicopters and so on. And a very, very small token kind of window dressing bar that says, oh, we give some food to the community every now and again, or we take kids in and give them an educational day and so on. We want to see that the other way around. So I've got a very, very small armed unit that backs up the Mambas, should the Mambas come across something. But their primary role is to disrupt the landscape and make it difficult for the poachers to come in undetected. We do a lot of visual policing with roadblocks. We know the routes where the poachers come in, and we know we're not going to catch somebody at a roadblock it's a bit obvious you know they're going to send a lead vehicle through and they'll just phone back and they'll say don't come this way go the other way but at least we know that route is closed down and at least they know that the area is hot now we buy another day okay then look at that weapon that's a, a homemade weapon it's a 375 it's it's homemade but the significant part about that we need to monitor the behavior of a poacher or a criminal that weapon has a homemade silencer. It's made from a mag-like torch and stuffed full of steel wool, and it's bopped onto the front of the barrel of that thing, which compromises its velocity and its accuracy and, and its, its bizarre safety protocols. <laughs> that gun is more dangerous than a landmine. Now, the reason why a poacher would put a silencer on a weapon is because he doesn't want to be detected. In the beginning, they weren't using silencers. They were just shooting day and night, etc. So you can measure the success of your operations by looking at how the criminal's behavior changes. A lot of you guys will know Dr. Tony Cunningham. We've been in cahoots quite a bit, and he's doing quite a lot of very interesting research on the traditional medicines of the poachers. Okay, so the, you can read into how effective your team has been, depending on what kind of traditional medicine the poachers are carrying. They want to remain invisible, they want to be bulletproof, they want to dodge lions and crocodiles, etc. They want to slow uh, down your units, throw your dogs off scent, so on and so on. So as they, as we evolve, they evolve as well. It's a bit like an arms race. So that weapon was very telling. First of all, we've confiscated so many weapons in the community, they now have to make their own. Secondly, they, they're deploying silences and they're coming in the middle of the night. And when they hear or see a vehicle, they drop everything and they run away. They don't stand their ground and try and fight us. They're probably too scared to pull the trigger on that thing. I know I am. This is a very boring slide, so I'll whiz through it very quickly. But this is on the, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a Spencerized X and Y axis. So on the Y axis, the vertical axis, you've got level of responsibility or, or threat level or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and on the ground, on the X axis, you've got hectares covered. And the broadest part of my pyramid is my bobbies on the beat, my black mambas. I want them patrolling the same beat every day and every night. They need to have so much institutional knowledge that they can say that vehicle driving over there is Mrs. Jones going to shop. She goes every Monday at eight o'clock and then she picks up her kids at school and she'll be back at two. 
but that red vehicle over there, I don't recognize that car, let's go check it out. Or they hear a gunshot at night and they'll call the operations room and say, won't you please phone the people on Cambridge 7? I'm sure they're shooting at elephants to chase them out of the yard again. You know, rather than get helicopters in the sky and a whole big um, show that costs 15,000 Rand or whatever, because they have institutional memory of their beat. And they'll walk it several times a day and they will say, wow, that rock wasn't turned upside down this morning on our first patrol. Let's investigate further. Something's kicked that rock over. Oh, heard a buffalo came through, no problem. Or let's put an OP up there tonight, an observation post. But without that, that bottom component, and you'll see it's the broadest. So they're covering the most ground and the most hours in a 24 hour period. And there's a lot of them. And then you go up to the next level. And normally a national parky kind of institution will only start here. They won't have this bottom component. So they'll only have the, the tactical response, the armed the guns, the bombs, the cool stuff, you know, the, the Boy Scout stuff. You can't get away from having this at all. You're always going to have to have a little component of this. But this is my smallest investment. These guys are not specialists. So it's myself and my ops room people that sit up here, the information comes in. And it goes all the way down. But as long as people understand the, the rationale behind the black mambas being unarmed and walking a beat, and everybody criticizes us and says, but you know what, hey, you're walking the same area every day and every night at the same time. So I'm perfectly aware of that. Thank you very much. And they say, why don't you mix it up? Because the poachers know when you are going to be on patrols. Exactly. So we're closing the window for them to operate optimally. They can't operate at full moon. We're forcing them into the darkest hours of the night. We're pulling them deeper into the landscape so that they have to compromise themselves. They have to use landmarks like old windmills and power lines and things to navigate. And they have to walk far. And at that time of the night, they're going to probably use a torch at some stage and expose themselves. Or they are going to have to move at maybe three kilometers an hour rather than five kilometers an hour, which gives us depth to follow up on something. So do you understand? I can't cover the whole reserve 24 hours a day. But what I can do is I can force those criminals into the suboptimal arena. So they go home empty handed many of the times, or they have to come back three or four times to get their prey, or they expose themselves or something like that. That is the ethos around here. Rather than hiding in the bush on, we've got 62,000 hectares here. Imagine you're hiding in the bush now with your little tactical team and somehow you assume that the poacher is going to walk past in, in visual range. Rubbish, you're going to lose a rhino. Disrupt the landscape, keep the guys out. Our job is to save rhinos, not to put people in, uh, what is that thing called, in the morgue. Because I want role models in the communities. These ladies go back home. Everybody is amazed and perplexed. They say, how is it possible? We've all been sent home from these high-end lodges. They are charging 15,000 rand a night for a guest to come and stay at the lodge. And I've been sent home with no salary. And yet these ladies are still going home every day with nice rations, nice houses, nice salaries, with dignity, with uh, job security and all of that kind of thing. And other people are amazed and perplexed. So that's another uh, spin-off of COVID-19, by the way, is that I suddenly managed to leapfrog my role model part of our ethos in the communities because they are like so perplexed. They're like, hmm, it pays now to work in saving wildlife because the, the hospitality industry is just like, yeah, we've made our 20 million. So we're sending you guys home now. And when we open our doors again, we'll let you in. And by the way, I'm going to my holiday house in Fleersby whilst I've got the chance until this thing is over. I, I have a problem. I, had, I won't lie. I have a little bit of a problem with a high-end lodge closing down and sending the people home because their profit margin has been interrupted. Where's the loyalty to your game rangers and your staff? You know, sure. Anyway, we've tightened our belts tremendously. So my NGO, Trans Frontier Africa, we have a number of fingers in a number of pies and uh, the wildlife security is just one of them. But we've pulled all our resources. So everything else is shut down. The, everything from the research to our, our alien invasive ecology interventions, everything has been shut down. So all the resources are going into this project right now. Because what's the point of, you know, we've invested, it's eight years into this and we can't lose the ground that we've gained now, especially in the communities. You know, to build this pride and this dignity and the role models and so on. It's worked so well. And if we interrupt it now, that eight year investment will be lost in, in weeks and it will be a total waste. And we put all of our eggs into the 
wildlife economy basket and the wildlife economy has come to a grounding halt. And, you know, we made some maybe critical errors in the past because if you work for Craig Spencer, you'll always be poor because our morals and our ethics are our worst enemies. So you know, we, we were offered money from certain sectors, the mining sector, for example, on our boundaries and the, the consumptive users, the trophy hunters, etc. We denied them the privilege to, to fund us and therefore here we sit. But at the same time, we kind of saw that there was either going to be some socio-political um, thing happening. We had no idea COVID-19 was going to jump us. So we built up a bit of a nest egg and we invested it into a nature reserve for these ladies. So right on the border, not inside the park, but on the border of the park, we have a small nature reserve where these ladies do all their training and whatever. And it's, it's got quite a high value as a 220 hectare land with some houses on it and whatever. And, um, and we, we can take out loans against that and whatever, you know, we haven't got there yet, but it's in the pipelines that we will, is it called mortgage? I don't know anything about finances. I just spend other people's money. I don't know how to make it. We will be okay. These ladies are used to suffering as well. So tightening their belts and, uh, you know, earning less and their allowances might disappear and so on and so on but we're hanging in there. I try and make it sound honey and roses and things, but you know, there are some realities like our tires on the vehicles are bald and the shock absorbers have fallen off and la la la. And we're not going to be able to replace things like that. The money is going into salaries and food rations and fuel for the, for the deployment and the patrols. There's no money for anything else now. So it's picking up your uniforms and using wire to keep your boots together and la 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 la. And we'll get through it, hopefully. In fact, I'm sure we will. You know, we won this Champions of the Earth award from the United Nations. And I think it was because it's significantly an all women approach to this, where women are celebrated for being women and not a bunch of men employing women to make them into little men with bras, if that makes sense. Because there's quite a lot of these initiatives around. They've asked us for our input all the way from Kenya to Zambia all over the show. And we, we quite happily give our business plans and all the research from the social scientists have been done on it. And the significant thing is one of the mistakes that have been made is to employ women and then to train them and dress them up like men and then redeploy them and say, I'm so very proud of myself because I took a bunch of women and I made them into men. You know, that's not what women empowerment is about. <laughs> women empowerment is about recognizing the, the values that women can bring to the landscape and then building on that and celebrating that. Be a proud woman. This is a, a, a famous quote from, this is Felicia Mogokani. She, she came in and she had her first baby and it was a big celebration, EDC. She said, I don't want to live in a village full of widows and orphans because that's the reality. And we actually give the, the upper hand to the crime syndicates on every time we take the, the breadwinning men out of the community and we lock them in jail or we put them in a body bag. We leave orphans and widows behind. And that's where your social and moral decay comes in. You know, how cool is it for a young kid to grow up and that his role model is somebody scooting around in a BMW with a massive big house and so on because he's a poacher. And this guy says, why should I bother to go to school when I can go and poach a rhino or get a bag of abalone and I can have all those cool things by the time I'm 19 or whatever, you know, I'm like 150 and I still haven't got those cool things. So, you know, that's the reality. We want them to see that there's, and, and, and there's another thing. Not everybody is a criminal. You really have to have a, a criminal mind to want to sneak around at nighttime with a gun and a silencer, you know, and shoot an animal and hack its face off and come back out. You, you, you've got to, this is premeditated criminal activity. That's a very small percentage of the human race that has this. So, you know, we, we very quick to say, oh, everybody's a poacher. It's not true. Because if that becomes a social norm, that that's actually celebrated and those guys are the heroes in the community, then yes. Then we've had a shift in values. We don't want to see that. So the one mamba says they don't want to live in a village of orphans and widows. The other mamba says, we don't want to live in a land without wild animals. And I'm saying, well, no, you must decide now can't have it both ways, you know? So we have a joke about that all the time. This is one of our orphaned rhinos that was taken off the landscape after its mother was poached. We have a few of them. They're dotted around in various rehabilitation facilities and the mambas are engaged with them daily looking after them. There's a small team of mambas that specialize in this kind of thing. 
in the tactile communication with the animals uh, really leapfrogs people's um, psychology about animals. So a, a good example is how we value pets compared to how somebody from the local village here will value a pet. Now, I treat my dog as a member of the family. A dog in that community is a functional item. Just like a donkey, it pulls your cart or whatever it might be. And we think it's terrible for somebody to go in and chop the face off a rhino. Like, how could anybody do that? Oh my goodness, it's terrible. I dare you to go and buy a chunk of beef or goat in the local rural community here because it's the same, you know? So it's not true to say, oh, they're so dehumanized and la, 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 la. Okay, so we inter integrated the canine unit into the Black Mambas for that very reason. Not so much that canines are very effective in catching poachers, that's true. But also the bond that you can form so that my mambas can take that back to the community and say animals can actually feel stresses as well. They can feel unloved, they can feel heat stress, they need water, they need food, and they need cuddles every now and again. The rhinos taught them that, and then we decided to go over to the canine angle as well to try and build that ethos so it's it's no longer acceptable so i have a village patrol that walks around and they do a little audit on everybody's pets now and they come back and they say hey mrs jones your pet is uh, lying in the sun and its water bowl hasn't been cleaned for a week and so on so that's pretty cool and it's uh, you know i never anticipated any of these things to grow and evolve out of this project i just wanted to stop the poachers killing my rhinos but the next thing you know we've got all of these cool angles Craig, yes. when I was there filming some years ago, I remember chatting to some of your ladies and they were literally weeping at the sight of a, of a poached rhino. It's almost like it was their children. Uh, have you found mm -hmm. that sort of uh, emotion? Yes, we actually picked it apart because, you know, I thought, how is, you know, I know the, the African people are very in touch with their emotions compared to us. We've, we've um, built up an ability to kind of hide our emotions. So, you know, they, they, they're very expressive, if you like. And... Uh, I wanted to get to the bottom of it because I'm an anthropologist by trade now. And, you know, what is it that triggers these emotions? And it's, it's two things. The one is the, the absolute sense of failure. They felt, shabbat, you know, this happened on our watch. And this is absolutely unacceptable that somebody managed to do this. Secondly, the betrayal. This is somebody from our community that we probably know, you know, and they came in and they know we are. How dare they? You know, they pull a greater Thunberg. How dare you? come in, you know, that's absolute utter betrayal. And then the last thing that scored quite low actually was oh, the poor rhino. So that was interesting for me. Um, you know, that those first two things, the, the sense of failure and then that betrayal because they think it casts them in a bad light, uh, which is true. So, um, you know, it's happened a few times. You know, one of the worst patrols we ever did, they found a rhino, it was still alive, it had just been shot, and they followed up on the gunshots, and they arrived on the scene, the poachers fled, and the rhino was thrashing around, and I said, secure the scene, we're on our way, and then they heard another shot, and I said, okay, that one's dead, there's nothing we can do about that, let's go see, and they went to there, and another dead rhino, we found three, those poachers killed three, so they kept bumping into rhinos on their way out of the park, but they never got the horns, but it, that, that affected the mambas tremendously, that was like, that's it, we are useless, we, we, are, we are not making any difference, and our people are taking us for a pop, you know, <laughs> not respecting the work that we do and so on. And that, that hurt them quite hard, that particular unit. But um, yeah, they bounce back like a rubber ball. Never happened again, I'll tell you that much. If you say, you know, who are you as a black member? Every time the media or the press comes around, then I try and write down the answers that they give. And these are the, the answers that we get back. I've just summarized, obviously. We breadwinners. And yeah, that's very significant for them. We have respect both in the community and in the workplace. We have pride, skills, dignity comes out so many times. And uh, we have an identity as part of a family. That's the thing. They're like, oh, this uniform, this badge, you know, you, we worked hard for this and we are this fantastic little unit of, oh, it's like a Shangri-La kind of thing. It's nice. It's heartening. Something that we've learned is if you make an investment into somebody, you see a return on that investment. It has to be long-term. So I can't employ a member and then churn them out and say, this is a job creation project. I need to have a, a whole bunch of different faces every three years or so. No. The members that started in 2013 are still with me to this very day. And they've grown up through the ranks. I have staff sergeants now. I've got all sorts. It's quite challenging to find ways uh, to incentivize so that they can work towards a different goal.
but it's it, that's very important. And then they become the the, uh, the trainers of the next intake of mambas. Some of them do fall off the bus, of course. They get better jobs elsewhere, which is really good for them. And then we do a um, an annual audit on their abilities. It's an external audit done by an overseas bunch from the Dutch Institute for Crime and Law Enforcement. They test them on their ability to detect gunshots, tracks coming in, how they report on these things, and what's their, their work ethic kind of thing. And those that score below a certain amount, they get given three months and they will get reevaluated again. If they don't make it, okay, bye. Because we have to, this badge has to stand for something. It's not a safe harbor for lazy people. But we use a lot of technology as well to, to boost the mambas. Because, you know, you, we, we like to use their eyes and ears, but those don't work terribly well at night time. So then we need, we need different technologies. And there's also a thing that says, if you're going to deploy somebody in the law enforcement arena, you have to protect them, both against poachers and wild animals and so on, but also against speculation and, and corruptibility. So if they come across a carcass or a rhino dies somewhere and it doesn't get reported because they didn't patrol there. You know, the speculation is rife that they involved somehow, that they aided the poacher, that they weren't doing their job properly and whatever. So the patrol orders go out from their own operations room that's manned by their own people. That's verified by myself. And then everything is monitored on a little screen. I get this report six o'clock every evening and six o'clock every morning. to show what the patrols were up to, where they were, where the rhinos, what are the hotspots, what did they see and detect and blah, blah, blah. That's really important for me that, that they know that they are being watched. It's not that I don't trust them. It's just that I need to go back to lodges and landowners and things and justify why something happened or why something didn't happen. You know, uh, and that's, that's what's lacking a lot. It's like those body cams that the, um, that the cops have overseas. Now imagine how much skullduggery has been stopped because of that. You know, and, and how much of the, their Criminal Procedures Act actually gets followed now because they know that there's accountability somewhere along the drag. This is another example of my little report. These are my teams. Okay, and that's that X and Y axis is time of the day on the X axis and the distance covered in kilometers. So I have a number of different ways that I evaluate how effective we have been on a patrol. And there's no point in patrolling in the heat of the day, uh, you know, so that's the rest hours, but I want to see that they were active during the times when the poachers would have tried their luck. Now, going back a little bit, if I look at what's going on in your abalone and rock lobster shenanigans down there, it would appear that the poachers have got free reign. So they, they are probably, um, you know, they, their harvesting technique is probably dictated by the tides, and they don't care if it's day or night because there's no fear landscape. A, a, a criminal responds best to to upping the threat level, you know, I mean, you can try and devaluate the product by putting pink dye in it and, you know, dog poison or whatever that they try to put in the horns and so on. But the best way to deter criminal activity is actually to make it more risky. The risk of being detected, the risk of being apprehended, the risk of, of being injured or whatever it might be. Otherwise, that graph, you will see poacher activity will be flatline any time of the day or night, as it was in, in the Meningen, you know, there was just poaching any time of the day. You'd hear gunshots in the daytime. We found camps where they were camping. They must have been there for weeks because the ash pit, the, the pile of ash was this high. And so that doesn't happen anymore. And, you know, we can't measure our success in how many poachers have been arrested. What we can do is we can measure our success on how many non-poaching days we've had, you know, and then this kind of thing. The poachers have been pushed into suboptimal times. They are nervous to come onto this landscape. They disguise their tracks. They cover them up. They throw snuff out to distract the dog's noses. They, they don't cut the fence wires anymore like they used to. They find other ways to get in and out. They hide the weapons. They do all sorts of things. That means you're winning. And then another way that we look at um, our success, where's my little cursor gone? Okay. So here's just a, a quick example of incursions. And the, so the mambas detect where the poachers are coming in because they see the tracks and little pieces of paper lying on the ground from their sweeties that they eat and their cigarette butts. Then, so you notice here they were using the railway line, the services, the mines in Palabawa. And they needed the railway line to come because that's how they navigate and they can get in and out, okay? And then they find rhinos and they murder them all. Then a new hotspot develops. So as we move our patrols around and we close down, so you can see how the landscape for the poachers changes. This, this is from April that year to, and this was at the peak of our poaching, we were losing like three and a half rhinos a day. 
uh, down to what it was back then that you know we could apprehend and prevent them from getting deeper into the landscape this was this was open season back then I mean, it was frightening that all our rhino hotspots were being hit daily and nightly until we figured out where they were coming in interesting story the mambas picked up what they assumed was poacher incursions as his tribal land yeah maseki tribe and we never knew that so i only deployed that team up there uh, in that same week and then we took cameras from this area and we moved them there and within 24 hours we got that now these are pictures taken on this landscape from the gsm camera traps after we deployed the cameras because of what our boots on the ground showed us we should be doing very effective uh, that's a typical mamba station uh, there were five of them on the landscape i've reduced that now down to three okay they go on daily foot patrols looking smart in your face in the public interface uh, nighttime patrols we disrupt the landscape we'll sit with a herd of rhinos we will drive around and make a lot of noise and so on we're not traffic officers sneaking around trying to find you we want to disrupt you in my landscape and then of course we check people coming in and out building checks vehicle checks uh, we'll go to contractors we also have 10 primary schools that we've adopted there's 1300 young kids that get a black mamba interaction every day the mambas love this part of their work more than anything else and they fixed up the classrooms to make it nice for the teachers and for the students to go to school and they mobilize them and uh, you know it's it's great and they love the mambas here and the mambas love them it's amazing how much they enjoy interacting with the children and how much the children respond to somebody in uniform it's very different and you know, here we see somebody in uniform we're like oh what's so i'm gonna get drafted into the army or what is cooking now you know or something but when they see the mamas because they cheer they're like so happy to see someone and they all want to stand at attention they all call them such and such and such and very heartening actually this is a couple of bush kitchens this is something that i wanted to mention bush meat we we neglect everybody focuses so much on Poachers coming in with guns. Yes, we've lost a lot of rhinos to poachers with guns. We've lost a damn sight more animals and animals of ecological significance to snares. Because, you know, you train somebody up to go after a poacher with a gun and he's like, eh, hey, whatever. I'm not interested in a snare poacher. It's Mickey Mouse. It's like, um, you know, the guy taking the periwinkles off the rocks uh, and, and stealing bucky loads of beach sand gets ignored by the law enforcement officials because they want the Palamun poacher because that's where all the glory and the fame is. You have to start with everything. We've lost more lions, rhinos, cheetah, wild dogs, everything to snares for the bush meat trade. That has been stamped out. There was such a big problem. I had to get flatbed trucks in to remove all of those snares and the snare camps that were on this landscape when the Mambas discovered them. Now we have nothing. There's no snaring on our landscape anymore. It's bizarre. Thanks to the Mambas. Okay, so there's been quite a lot of research done by various social scientists from all over the show because we wanted them to try and show us whether we were investing in the right places, whether our model worked. We've made some big changes. You can read that text yourself. One of, one of the, my proudest moments was um, giving these guys their driver's badges. You know, I've got a fleet of Land Rovers that are ancient. They're falling apart in teams. And yet these ladies drive them over the most challenging landscapes all over the show. It's, I mean, it's crazy. So there's a few key findings that came out, you know. The, the women upliftment part is very important. And then, of course, the, the community residents. I will, I'll just let you read that quickly because I think it's quite significant. In all the four target communities, the value of wildlife and protected areas on a, on a scale of 1 to 10, the average was 8 out of 10 or they recognize the value and are encouraged by the benefits that the big five landscape brings. The most important thing that we realized here is those communities where we have the schools were the black mambas and the black mambas come out of the bush after a patrol and they go to the schools and they say, sure, that was great. You should have seen those elephants, man. And then I was there and then the lions were Rawr! and the hyenas were, nah! you know, and I managed to make it to school. And the kids love that. In the communities where we don't have primary schools, the averages are much lower. So it's actually, you've got to have that combination of both the, the patrols on the landscape and the interaction with the kids. That's where we're scoring our highest. I'm done. Thanks, Craig. Will you unshare your screen? And any of you who have any questions, please don't you put them in the chat box for us to ask Craig. Are you positive about the future of uh, protected areas, um, given that we don't know what's happening with COVID? Just how are you feeling? Is there a sense of hope or are you a bit scared or how are you feeling? Um, 
you know, the, we have we have days of hope and then days of despair. So, you know, one of the things that's concerning us quite a lot is is how the values um, towards our wildlife are changing in legislation in this country. There's not many countries where you own wildlife. We we one of them in sub-Sahara Africa, and there's Namibia in that as well. But it's um, you know, wildlife will be diminished in value in people's minds if, uh, first of all, we have to cut off their horns to save them and shave their manes to save them and pluck the scales out of pangolins to save them, you know, and so on. And then to fund conservation, we will sell ivory, rhino horn and pangolin scales, you know, to, to, to put the money back into conservation. And then we also put it on the, on the market. So if it's in the national park, it's okay. But the minute it's outside the national park, it's an agriculturalized animal. You know, I'm, I'm struggling to grasp this. We, we have a global movement that is, that is moving in a certain direction philosophically and ethically and morally towards wildlife and animals. And yet here we're sitting in South Africa going, you know what, we, are, we acknowledge that the Northern Hemisphere is pretty much paying for our wildlife conservation here because that's where our tourism comes from. They're pretty much paying. The NGOs money comes from there. The lodges, the very reason why we have a wildlife economy, whether it's consumptive or non-consumptive, is because of the influence of the Northern Hemisphere. But we're not going to listen to those trends that are happening there. We're going to carry on regardless because we're going to try and please a really small sector of our community. Exactly the same problem we've got in fisheries, buddy. Okay, so, so we, it, it is, you know, it's, it's because it's political. And, and you know, we, we need to get to the point where we're saying wildlife is wildlife. It does not have to justify its existence on this planet. We have a moral obligation to look after it. We don't have to find the cure for cancer in rhino dung to protect the rhino, you know, and we don't have to um, discover that the Orothamnus zeyeri growing on the top of Pochelberg uh, makes the best tea and therefore it's worth protecting. And then guess what? We're going to agriculturalize it. I don't know one species that's been agriculturalized that still exists in the wild in its true form, you know. So we, we, that's a very, very thin line. So when I read that kind of stuff, I think, oh, my goodness. Are we going to be stuck with the little Pilansberg and the little Kruger National Park and the Karoo National Park? Are we going to be stuck with that as the, as the only icons of our wildlife left? Or are we going to allow people to hang a Rembrandt on the wall in their house and be proud of it? Are we going to stuff it all into the Louvre? If you understand what I mean. 100%. Look, a lot of conservationists uh, get quite depressed about the state of the world. and uh, uh... That's why we have rum. <laughs> so so why why do you stay positive why why do you have a smile on your face what gets you up every day why do you keep going despite some of the challenges and especially now that is a very good question because we ask ourselves that all the time and you know there's a big irony in this we came to do this to get away from people and to connect with nature and then we suddenly realize that the thing that keeps us going our motivation actually comes from people you know, so, so we do what we do because we have a lot of people that believe in what we do. You know, and the Mambas have quite a big following out there. We can't fail those people. We can't fail those people that came and helped us set it up from the States and Germany. And, you know, this dog comes from the, the Frankfurt Dog Academy in, in Germany, you know, because they saw value in the work that we do. I can't fail them. So, so we feel obliged to carry on. And they give us a lot of moral support. Just having um, talks like this and seeing some old faces and old names that I haven't seen for a while. And it's great to see you guys again. You know, that's stimulating for us. So the animals don't give you any positive reinforcement. You take a snare off, a, off an elephant's foot and he wakes up, he wants to kill you, you know, and you say, <laughs> you save a lion from something, you know, and you let him go again. He just wants to turn around and bite you to death. So you're not getting any positive reinforcement from the animals. They're not coming back and holding a a guard of honor for you when you drive out the reserve. But it's the people. It's the people that, that share your things and, and write to you and ask you for an answer and ask these questions that you're ask, asking now because we pay this over in our heads every day and every night before we go to bed and nobody's ever asked us our opinion. What can we do at home? We don't all wear khaki. We don't all patrol along the, along the borders. Uh, how, how can we help? How can we, how can we contribute? Yeah. I'll tell you what the Mambas told me. Okay, so we were putting together a little play a script. So they do this every now and again, you know, and then they reenact something that happened, like the poachers coming in or whatever. And I asked them the same question, and they said, We might lose this little 
thing that we're trying to do now. But if we can make one contribution to this planet, it's to bring our children into the world with the right moral compass. I'm, I'm putting words in the mouth because of course it was a much longer drawn out Shangan story, but if I put it into a nutshell, it's exit your children into decision-making, whether they're bank managers or, or IT specialists or whatever, that they must have that moral compass to be responsible users of this planet. So my job and my mamba's jobs and your guys' jobs and what have you is, is first to keep our fingers in the dikes. And I don't mean that in, in the hoodspread sense. I mean that in the Dutch sense, okay? The, um, you know, so when that generation, the next generation grows up, and we've all mollycoddled our kids and given them the correct morals and ethics to live by and the right um, value systems, then we can retire and relax a little bit. That's the dream, you know? That's the best we can do. That, that is more important to bring your children up, okay? We'll, we'll do our very best to make sure that there's still rhinos and elephants and lions and things careening around on the landscape. But we need the, the, the parents to teach the children how to do better. That makes sense. I sound like Greta Thunberg now. That's a good thing. Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> well, Craig, thanks. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your for your inspiration, and uh, we really appreciate you sharing sharing this hour with us. Don't stop doing what you're doing. Keep fighting the good fight there, and uh, yeah, we're really grateful, and uh, we miss you out here in the Overberg. And keep us updated, and maybe we'll do another chat in a couple of weeks' time about. Um, elephants and uh, there have been too many of them like you wanted to chat about absolutely bring it on i've got a lot to say about that as well <laughs> thank you and for, for all of you who, who are on the chat uh, thanks for tuning in and next week we've got don talking about birds and composers and uh, yeah we really love you to join us um and i'm just reading a, a last a last comment here thanks craig uh, everyone needs to have the respect for nature regardless of the career they end up following so that's from Shireen. absolutely that's Thanks, very Craig. true. You know, whether you're putting it, I just want to point out whether you're putting up a cell phone mast on a landscape and, and you have no regard for where you put your road to access it and that sort of thing and how ugly it's going to look and la la la. Everybody, I can't think of a single job that is more important than another one when it comes to looking after this planet. You know, my job is, is quite insignificant at the end of the day. It's the bank managers that are managing people's monies. It's the IT guys. It's the it's ESCOM just putting their power lines willy nilly to save money. They put it on the shortest route. Blah, blah, blah. We want decision makers from this current generation that's growing up now, okay, to move into those positions where they are thinking broader than profit. Responsible users. People do want to get in contact with you. Do they just go onto your Black Mamba Facebook page, or how do they how do they stay in touch? How do they answer questions? Yeah, that's a good question. Shall I quickly write my email on the chat thing? Yes, please. I'm, I'm clicking it. It's coming. All right. So this is my email address. Craig S at transfrontierafrica.org. Is it, did I spell that correctly? Transfrontierafrica.org. And then the Mambas, if you want to know more about them, it's so very easy. Back Mambas. Oh, la, la. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Excellent. Have a good day. Thank Avoid you guys. those elephants that you walk into this morning. <laughs> it's going to be frightening when I go back tonight. It's going to be like running the gauntlet. <laughs> Stay safe. <laughs> Very good. Thanks for your time. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.